Well, good morning, everybody. This forecast video is going to focus on a couple of things here. We're going to start off with, a, again, a, a recap of just how dry things have been. And I want to walk you through something new I developed yesterday, which really tries to look at the patterns that would uh, have to come into play to break the drought that's in the central United States. We're going to walk through the upcoming pattern, see what's going to do that. We're going to stretch it out into the new longer range uh, European weeklies. And I've got some new long range forecast data from the uh, IRI multi-model probability group out of Columbia University to finish this up. I will also take a quick look at South America. But I wanted to show you this to begin with. You've been watching an animation uh, in the uh, infrared. So these are our satellites that are looking down at about, I think it's somewhere close to 11 microns is the wavelength of the uh, of the satellite here. And the long wave infrared really just shows a neat feature last night. So after yesterday's um, temperatures kind of rose in the midsection of the United States, high pressure settled in. And it's amazing that you can see how quickly the land cooled off last night. So you can see right down to the surface, no cloud cover getting in the way here. And it was just amazing to watch how, how cold it got underneath this high pressure cell. You can also watch this trace out the behavior of that fold we mentioned. Okay, so if I click play, you'll see the cloud field moving in the direction of the um, of the line I just drew. And that's what will promote this high pressure that's diving into this area, producing, you know, the lake effect precipitation we talked about yesterday, which did spread into parts of the eastern corn belt and into the northeast. Uh, some areas got, you know, some some needed showers. It wasn't a lot of rain, but some areas did get some uh, some needed showers here. But if you look where things are this morning, there's just a big high pressure cell planted over Missouri. I mean, almost right on the river. And around it, we've got a couple of different things. Very cold air on the central and eastern side of it. In fact, you can see the position of the coldest air at the front, making it all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. But on the back side, we've already begun to recover the strong southerly winds uh, that are going to be a part of, of what I think will be a significant fire threat in the midsection of the United States. And the National Weather Service, of course, picks up on this as well. The shading of color represents where we do have our uh, red flag warnings that are out. So for parts of, of California, uh, getting into uh, you know this part of Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, and then, of course, the Central Plain states. We have pretty extensive freeze warnings and frost advisories and frost watches and freeze watches that extend uh, some of them deep into the Mid-South and Southeast here. And then you're going to watch this kind of dot its way up through parts of the Northeast as well as that cooler air begins to kind of exit in that direction. We do have a couple of areas of winter weather advisory on the back side of this system as well. And we're going to be looking at some more snow piling up in the Rocky Mountains as that cutoff that we've been talking about uh, all week kind of moves through. Now that's happening uh, in the next couple of days and it will last all the way to next Sunday before this thing starts to eject. So we'll come back to that in a few moments. But it's the red flag warnings that I'm quite concerned about given the wind forecast looks something like this over the next seven days. So it's already picking up in terms of the wind speed here today. But as that high pressure cell slides over the southeast, we set up that tight pressure gradient in the midsection of the country and we get, you know, winds that'll be gusting 40 to 50 miles an hour. Now, my worry with all of this, I think, is seen in this progression of maps I'm about to show you. So we're going to go back all the way to July the 15th, and we're going to look at soil moisture at 16 inches. Now, remember, back in, in July, we were talking about drought developing in parts of the Appalachian Mountains, getting into the Ohio Valley. We were talking about pockets of drought already beginning to form in the northwest and a few places in the central plains which have been dealing with year-on-year -year drought. But it was extremely wet through this corridor. And I, I don't think it takes much to remind you of that. And also very wet in eastern Texas as well, as we saw uh, by this point in July. This is after when Hurricane Barrel went through this area. But then fast forward a month, this would be August 15th. And then add another month to it into September 15th. And then we get here, which is October the 16th. And we can just see how dry this pattern has become over that time frame. And since the start of this month, this is where we currently stand. <clears throat> So these are precipitation ranks for the first 15 days of October compared to every other first 15 days of October going back to uh, 1893. And honestly, outside of Milton, a storm that hit right here on the uh, Iowa, Illinois, Missouri border, and then some of the moisture that has come into parts of the Northeast, uh, that's about all we've had in, in the month of October. So we have many places here that are looking at one of their top five or top three, or in some places the driest. Uh, such time periods on record. So I've I've told you that I've been working on some sub-seasonal forecasting ideas. I'm trying to get these out, reading papers, trying to just understand the process better. It's something that I have a career goal at working on. And I just wanted to make something simple. So yesterday afternoon, I, I wrote some code to do something. 
uh, I'm going to pick Lincoln, Nebraska, just as my analysis point. And what I wanted to do is simply this. I wanted to go back over the last 40 years of high resolution precipitation data we have. And I wanted to find the top 10 wettest such time periods in October. Five day chunks. Just look for some wet time periods in the month of October and attempt to understand what the atmosphere had to do to get us there. And I wrote this for a lot of variables, but it always kind of comes down to one thing, which is the upper level height field. That's what that's kind of what the, the pattern has to do. So forgive the crudity of the maps. We're just looking for features here. And I noticed this. If we're going to get wet in, in, in Lincoln, there's got to be a ridge that's going to be placed somewhere here over the northeast and some troughing that happens in this area. So it's October. And uh, that's what you got to have because that's going to lift, you know, the air in the mid atmosphere here, opening up the gulf in the lower levels and, and bring in that moisture. What was interesting was about seven days before seven days before these rainy events happened, we had a low that set off the northeast coast and a high that set off of uh, kind of, you know, England here. I also noticed upstream troughs of low pressure coming off of Siberia and a ridge that lived over Alaska. So the flow could come around, dive, run up, and then get bunched up as it went across parts of the Atlantic, basically slowing it down, giving us better chances of having multi-day precipitation events here. So I said, well, what about 14 days before? So oftentimes the atmosphere had to get set up for this, which means it wasn't just a brand new thing that we got wet at some point in the month of October. We were already seeing these features, trough ridge, deep trough into the southwest, ridge somewhere up the east coast, and then bunch things up in the Atlantic. What I found interesting is I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. If you're, if you're going to have a, an above average precipitation time period in the central United States, you know, it, it takes momentum in the atmosphere to change and get, and to get into a new phase for that to occur in October, because we're looking at these fall months. So it just doesn't, you just don't get one really good soaking rain without having the pattern already being established with it. What I found interesting was this 30 days before we break things down, we tended to have this pattern, troughs here and here, and some ridging in the west. And we didn't have the bunched up pattern across the uh, North Atlantic. In stack, excuse me, in fact, we had much stronger winds that went to the southern side of an Icelandic low. And I was just thinking about all of that, knowing that we're here right now. This is where we've been since the beginning of October. So there are a few things that are out of place. Um, this isn't good for right now. This certainly isn't good for right now. And then we got the wrong, you know, if this low was way up here and you brought this ridge down, then I'd say, when it's going to get wet soon. It's going to get wet really soon. But we've got to overcome this pattern. Things begin must begin to shift around in order for this to occur. But now you know what, what would have to shift. Long story short, I need this trough to be here, this ridge to go there, and this trough to go up here. And then I'd like it if that guy came in and replaced this here, and we pushed that ridge into. So do you see how the whole pattern needs to shift? I don't know, 500 miles. It's got 500 miles, 1,000, I don't know, somewhere between there, maybe 1,000 miles. It's got to shift to the east. And we're just not there yet. And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, if you look at even where it's going over the next uh, 15 days, there are some things that I like, like this. I like the fact that we're getting a ridge of high pressure building in here. That's part of it. If I could get it a little bit farther, that'd be good. But I don't see yet the response in breaking down the pattern uh, across North America. So what I'm saying is there may be chances of precipitation in this upcoming 15-day forecast, limited. But it's not yet the full pattern to break over to wet. And so if we're thinking about breaking this, this drought we're dealing with, there's the soil moisture again. There's the uh, precipitation ranks. We've got a long way to go in modifying this pattern in order to get us there. So again, if that ridge went to Alaska, this trough came to the southwest, it'd be game on. But instead, we're looking at something like this over the next 10 days. We have one piece of the jet stream that's going to dive in here and cut itself off. Now, if I could have brought a full trough in here, not a cutoff low, whole different story for this entire region but we don't. That's all we've got is this one week little cutoff load that's going to come here. It's going to sit and spin, add some snow to the Rockies and try to make it out. We do see better precipitation coming in at times into parts of the Northwest, but overall we've yet to see the full evolution of a pattern that can just drive 
better flow into the United States. And to be honest with you, this comes back to first principles when you think about the way the weather behaves across North America. If you get flow going this way, we're going. It's going to be trough after trough after trough and, 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 and high impact system. If we don't, if we have weak flow or at times the flow comes in like this, that is only in the months of June, July, and August does that ever produce precipitation in the midsection of the country. And during that time of year, we're dry over here anyway. So I, this, is, this is what it is. We cannot seem to achieve southwest flow consistently. So as a result, what do we see here? Over the next seven days, it's primarily going to be some decent flow coming into the northwest. This is not overly wet for them, though. Just understand, like th this is, you know, in mid-October, we've had systems that have just clobbered the northwest and just start up, you know, the very, very beginning of a wet season. And as you look at all of this, just take note, these numbers are not large. But as that low comes and dives into this area, could we increase the precipitation here? I think we really could. We could have chances of picking up an inch of rain, maybe more than that, in this particular area as we go forward in this forecast. But if you're outside of that, the pattern is extremely dry. Okay, so let's kind of walk through it. This is what I need to, to see happen a little bit differently. Uh, if you watch, as we get into Thursday into Friday, this is the wave coming in. Now, what we're looking at is a vorticity field. And vorticity just tells me about what's called cyclonic spin. That is where the air is spinning counterclockwise. And I wanted to show you that here's the cutoff low. And this is this ribbon of vorticity connecting it to a trough that I was hoping would be much deeper, but it's not. So the flow's gone over the top, the cutoff low sits here, and there's a little ribbon of vorticity in between. But that's the low that by Saturdays in parts of Arizona going toward New Mexico and Colorado, and it's still sitting there Sunday. Now what we're going to watch is, remember on these um, kind of vorticity maps, what you look for, remembering the spin is going this direction, is anywhere where you take these little ribbons of vorticity and move them to areas where there isn't, you get lift in the atmosphere. And that lift results in cooling, you get condensation and clouds. And so as we watch Saturday into Sunday into Monday, where does that happen best? Here. And that's where the atmosphere is responding by bringing out more precipitation in this area. Now this is Monday morning. That wave tries to get pulled back into the flow, but never fully makes it. And that's why we might have a corridor in through here that has chances of getting rain starting this weekend here and moving into early next week there. But the rest of this flow is, I mean, I'll be honest, it's just boring. It, it's doing this. And that is not this, right? So, so given that that's the pattern and we don't see it really breaking down, I mean, look at that. That is just, gosh, can we just get this guy to come sweeping through? No, it's just doing that. And as a result, we're unable to get a lot of precipitation out of this pattern. So we've already had our frontal boundary hit the northwest. We have the exiting upper level low here, the high pressure I mentioned. There it is. See it? And so as we play this forward, you can see the tight pressure gradient setting up today and tomorrow. That's going to drive the winds. Here's the low settling into the Rocky Mountains. Curls up right there. I mean, maybe, just maybe a little bit of precip out ahead of this. But this is all just coming around the backside low. I don't know where we're going to get the moisture for that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the models are trying. Then the low sits here on Saturday and Sunday. I'm talking about this guy. Another push of moisture comes into, I mean, more, more British Columbia than Washington. We're snowing in the Rocky Mountains this weekend. And then the low tries to eject right here. Now, normally, if I saw a high pressure cell sitting here, especially if I could get it farther to the east, we'd be talking about an opening up of the Gulf, but that's not quite the case. The high pressure is pretty large, so it's pulling air more from Mexico and in Western Texas than it is from the Gulf of Mexico. So this is why we're moisture starved here. And any moisture that gets into this area first out of the Gulf will be taken by the atmosphere and by the soil, by the vegetation that's left uh, before the atmosphere can use it to, to make a lot of precipitation. But we will be watching next week for a possibility of some stronger storms starting in the panhandles going through Kansas and, and, and uh, excuse me, well, possibly parts of Oklahoma, but more Nebraska. And then the low just kind of curls up here next Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe bringing in some showers into Illinois. But that was it. Like I, I focused on one thing because that's all we've got. Maybe some stuff running over the top of this. And I'll show you the tropics in a few moments. But we've got to break this whole pattern down to develop deep low pressure in the west before anything changes too much. I do want to show you there is some snow with this. So if we just play through the next seven days, 
shoot, let's go 10 days. I don't care. You can see some of the snowfall totals here at very high elevation. Biggest snows are going to be in the Rockies between, you know, Alberta and British Columbia and then along the coast. And then we're going to watch for ribbon of snow here north of Highway 16, uh, you know, through parts of, uh, you know, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba out of this as well, and possibly parts of the Canadian Maritimes. But here's the issue. 10 days from now, okay, I'd like it if a ridge built in here, but this trough needed to be much deeper. And if it was much deeper, if that trough was deeper, then we would have a much different precipitation outlook for the midsection of the country. But instead, we have this. Over the next 10 days, who has the best chance at staying under a half inch? There is some good news for the southeast, and it's going to be very dry, and the next couple of tropical systems are nowhere close to you. But this is going to continue to build drought in all of the places we've been watching drought for a while. Week two, okay, you start to see this potential for some wetter in here. That's mainly because the forecast is trying, trying to bring ridging into this area, which you now know is a recipe we need, and some sort of trough event into this area. But I'm just telling you, I, I can't I can't look at that and put a lot of hope in it until I see a much more well-defined trough coming into the West by the time we get out there toward the end of this month. And that's what this is looking at. So there's our week two forecast here. Back to the temperatures where we started today. Interesting map, you notice that parts of Colorado, western side of Nebraska, getting into the central part of the Dakotas, you don't have frost event. And that's already because of the strong winds that are back in that place, mixing the inversions out, keeping them away from our frost. You can also see the morning lows were not forecast to be that cold here because of it. But very, very cold across parts of the central U.S., east, northeast, all the way down to the southeast as well. There's Thursday. That's when the northeast gets really chilly. Friday, they maintain it. Big warm-up in the midsection of the country on Saturday. Again, it, this is just perfectly telegraphed. The high-pressure cell sitting here. There's the wind-up behind it. The trough is now diving into the four corner states, and it's got to ride this. And this is why it's going to die. There's no support for it. So it just can't get into this and, and, and do anything with it. It's just the wrong setup. We don't need a cutoff low. We need a big barrel of a trough diving into the country. But that's Saturday's minimum temperatures. Here's Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. High temperatures, just take a quick look at those. This is what I've got for Wednesday. Much cooler across the south, but the big warm-up already happening in parts of uh, Montana. There it is on Thursday, high winds, high temperature, high risk of wildfire. We then get into Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And you know what these maps are going to look like. There's day 5 through 10 and day 10 through 15. This is an encouraging sign for November. And the reason is because this would indicate that we're starting to bring in that low pressure into this area. And I've looked out there and I said, well, what is the new European model helping at all? Kind of. Now, if you remember back 10 minutes ago, what do we need in this area? We need some troughs. We need a ridge in between. We need a trough here. We need a ridge here. Trough off the coast, another ridge. We're starting to get a sense, not a full-blown, beautiful, wet pattern that so many in the midsection of the country need, but we're starting to get something that looks like it. And that's why if I zoom in on the United States and show you the 30-day precip outlook, look, see, see, it's trying. It's trying in November to bring in a wetter pattern. But uh, just understand that we, it, it needs to become way more amplified than currently forecast in order for that to occur. So I'm just trying to offer some reasons here. Okay, bigger picture things. What about... Um, La Nina. Well, this is interesting. I'm working on some other subseasonal stuff now that's going to use ocean temperature. That'll be my, my whole project all day today. We'll get about eight hours in on this. Hopefully, I have something interesting to show you from that. I doubt tomorrow, but soon. Uh, I did notice that the trade winds have picked back up. We can actually see the Southern Oscillation Index made a jump back up again. So that's indicating stronger trade winds in this area. But I noticed this as well. Those trade winds, while they're stronger now, that's the blue green you've seen here. They don't, it'll you know, by the end of the month, they may fade a bit. And that's common for La Nina. But if this La Nina was going to go full force and just rip its way into winter, this would be a never-ending kind of block of these colors all the way into the future that I could foresee, right? So this is why we think this La Nina might come in a bit weaker. I do want to mention that we are getting a positional movement in the MJO over toward phases 5, 6, and 7. We talked about that all week. But just take note at the end of October, better 
chances for taking the lid off the atmosphere, which is on right now in parts of the Caribbean uh, and the Gulf of Mexico. And while we are still watching a couple of systems, the National Hurricane Center downgraded this to a 40% chance of developing and downgraded this to a 20%. And the weather forecast models, they're still taking this, pushing it up against the big ridge of high pressure and just killing it. And the system coming out of the Caribbean is expected to go right into this part of Central America and Mexico. So no immediate threat from any tropical systems uh, in the near term, but it could be very wet in through this region as it moves through the Lesser Antilles toward the Greater Antilles. So the last couple of things, just a reminder on where NOAA currently sits with its forecast for La Nina. They went with a 75% chance, peaking somewhere in late December, early January, which is quite common. But their longer range forecast, which was just released, kind of reflects this. So we'll get the official CPC forecast, I think, later this week. But this is the one that was updated yesterday. Um, I'm going to come in here and I want to look just specifically at North America. And we're going to look at the November, December, January precip forecast. One thing to note, the model did go less dry in the midsection of the country and drier across the southeast. It went less dry in California as well. December, January, February. January, February, March. And this is where we've got kind of our highly variable Pacific jet exiting through the Ohio River Valley, weak subtropical jet. But it is important to note that they have taken more of the Midwest and the Plains onto this you know, wetter side of average than there was before, keeping the driest air anchored over parts of northern Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern California, which uh, Arizona has just been absolutely scorching hot for a while. Speaking of that, let's just go look at the temperature pattern. This is what they've got in terms of temperatures. That is nowhere near what this looked like a year ago. Can I show you a year ago? Oh, cool. Let's go back to last year. This was the forecast for last year uh, in midwinter. <laughs> Look at that. Very mild. And we'd had that. This was good, right? We, we were very mild across the northern tier of the United States. So let's now go to this year. And what you see as we get back to January, February, March, better chances of cold air intrusion coming through the northern tier of the United States. Doesn't mean it's going to be cold the entire winter, like I'm talking colder than average, but I do see better chances of intrusions of colder air. Okay, um, just brought, wanted to bring you the latest here. Let's go back, uh, precip one more time. That would be January, February, March. This is February, March, April. So the models have really honed in on very dry conditions in the Southwest. All right, what about South America? Ah, oh, the satellite data yesterday was really showing some deep convection. I watched it all day. This is just a snapshot from some high resolution data here, looking at some deeper convection. The model's still very aggressive on precip for the next 10 days, especially in Brazil's center west. Again, we're toward Goiás, Minas Gerais. I, I don't know how to say that. I gotta look that up. Minas Gerais, I don't know. Um, but very wet in this region. And compared to average, you can see here some places picking up 50 to 90 millimeters of excess rainfall. Southern Brazil, a bit drier. And uh, Buenos Aires, a bit drier but into central Argentina, we're looking quite wet as well. And the longer range forecast just continue to kind of keep a corridor wet in through here, bringing in some dryness later into Northeast Brazil. Okay, that's what I wanted to share today. I hope you all have a good rest of your day and we'll just pick this up again in the morning. Thanks.